Uh, well, I think you can see this morning, um, we deliberately selected a panel that would be multidisciplinary and people from quite different disciplines because as the, the steering committee discussed our purpose for this conference, we started off with a, a health conference and then we thought, well, you know, what best combines our strengths of Syracuse and Cornell that we thought, well, we need to bring food and nutrition into that and then we need to bring agriculture into that. And we decided to have a, a real mix of practitioners and people with applied backgrounds and people with um, other types of backgrounds. So you'll see today we'll have a variety of different kinds of speakers that um, uh, intersect, but sometimes you have to take a little time to see how they intersect and what they're bringing to the conversation. So that's, that's purposeful and we hope, that you, uh, we hope that you enjoy and take advantage of, of that. Um, good, after, or good morning, my name is Tim Dye and I'm a professor here uh, in public health and uh, we would like to welcome you to this session. We are focusing on health and food and contemporary experiences in South Asia. Another thing that you should probably know is when we were um, constructing what South Asia meant to us, we, we were quite broad in our definition, so you may hear from uh, areas that might be more towards Southeast Asia in our talks, and you may hear areas that are more toward Central Asia in our talks. Again, uh, that's purposeful to, to, to push our thinking, perhaps. So we have three papers uh, this morning. The first will be by uh, Professor Harris Solomon, who is with the Cultural Anthropology Department and Global Health at Duke. And he'll be presenting a paper entitled Street Cleaning, Food Politics, Hygiene, and Public Viability in Mumbai. And he will have 15 minutes, as will each speaker, 15 minutes for their presentation. And then we'd like to save questions for the end, if, if that's okay. We'd like to save uh, questions for about a half an hour period at the end. So, um, Dr. Solomon, please. And here is your clicker, if you'd like to use that. We also have a human back there who can <laughs> speak, so. I'll, I'll try this, and see if it works. Great, thank you very much. Um, thanks to the organizers for having me. Um, so I am part of the other non-practitioner. Um, I'm a cultural anthropologist, and um, I think one thing that stuck with me from Dr. Ray's talk this morning was about um, how food inserts itself into hostile territory, and uh, that's the story I'm going to tell you today. Uh, on a dry November evening in 2008, an elaborate festival celebrating Mumbai's quintessential street food called the Vada Pao belied the food's humble constitution. A chickpea-battered, deep-fried, spiced mashed potato patty, the Vada, tucked into a slightly sweet, soft bread roll, the pao. The vada pao is found virtually everywhere in the city, from alleyway vendors to train station kiosks. The evening festival, called the vada pao samelan, or the vada pao jamboree, was sponsored by the Shiv Sena, a regional political movement that promotes the rights of Marathi-speaking people born in the state of Maharashtra, whose capital is Mumbai. Since its beginnings in the 1960s, the Shiv Sena has promoted the rights of the Marathi Manus, or the native-born Hindu Maharashtrian, through a variety of performative and violent protests against outsiders, ranging from Tamils living in the city in the 1960s and 70s to currently labor migrants from the northern states of Bihar and Uttar Pradesh. As an influential bloc in the municipal government, the Shiv Sena consistently lobbies for what it calls reservations, or reserve job vacancies, for the Marathi Manus. They were unhappy with the progress of street side uh, excuse, uh, unhappy with the progress of instituting reservations, and so the Tsena took the Vodopau into its own hands as a potential street-side job creation project. The party announced its own version of the food, called the Shiv Vodopau, and embedded this old new commodity into an Indian megacity built on the tenuous grounds of heritage, cosmopolitanism, violence, and consumer appeal. The Shiv Sena, however, was not alone in its efforts to rebrand the Vodopau. Corporate startups had begun to sell branded vadapo in McDonald's-like restaurants, claiming that street food was dangerously unhygienic and that mass-produced uniform versions of it would be cleaner and safer. So the vadapo became a biopolitical lightning rod as taste mediated links between political alliances, bodies, and forms of public consumption. Based on 18 months of ethnographic research in Mumbai, broadly concerned with relations between food and the body, in this paper, I ask how food politics can powerfully mediate urban futures. I examine how the Vodapau anchored competing visions of urban consumptive risks, and I argue that these risks add up to a broader sense of city life through expressions of taste and hygiene. Just as hygiene places bodies and contaminants into familiar arrangements, so too do I suggest that it organizes regional politics alongside corporatism, violence with profit, and sanitation with cosmopolitanism. 
the Vodapao could channel risk and could be amenable to reform, and by extension, Mumbai streets could be too, because street food's possibilities for contagion were as culturally productive as they were digestively problematic. So I mean to use contagion here in its broadest sense of social connection. As Priscilla Wald writes, contagion points to, quote, the contact of individuals, often strangers, as it is registered both on their bodies and in their lives, end quote. Metaphorically, contagion encapsulates the infectious or viral popularity of street food, even as it reflects fears around unhygienic products or vendors. In her analysis of artisan cheesemaking, the anthropologist Heather Paxson introduced the concept of microbiopolitics to account for the ways that, she writes, dissent over how to live with microorganisms reflects disagreement about how humans ought to live with one another. She carefully explains that microbiopolitics is as much about governance as it is, as she puts it, using molecules as metonyms for individual or population characteristics. So drawing microbiopolitics into an analysis of street food here can infuse urban political analysis into reflections on food cultures in India and elsewhere. In this vein, a framework connecting taste and contagion is useful on several counts. First, it offers an alternative analytic stance to public health by decentering health as a singular uniform urban political ideal. Second, it offers an outlook on food politics that takes multiple forms of visceral risk into account besides the act of consumption, which to my view tends to be the conceptual gatekeeper between food and identity in a lot of writings and food studies. At the Shiv Vadapa Samilan itself, potatoes took center stage as the marker of an urban political formation that needed to spread in order to cohere. The Shiv Sena party leader, Udav Thakri, invited 27 of the city's Vadapau vendors to the Samelan to fry up thousands of free Vadapau, and he advertised the event widely. The winning recipe would become the official, official recipe of the Shiv Vadapau, which the Sena planned to launch several months later. The Shiv Vadapau would be sold in thousands of dedicated food stalls across the city based on the premise that the Sena supporters could receive jobs as vendors. The Sena positioned the Shiv Vadapau as the bellwether of taste and hygiene, because the food stalls planned for the Shiv Vodapau were made of stainless steel to ensure sanitation and clean frying. They hyped this party line brand using the narrative that the Vodapau was the food that nourished party members during violent protests in the 1960s and the food that energized Sena constituents during harsh economic times. Interestingly, they also invited marketers from McDonald's and Coca-Cola to add a slick consumer appeal to the enterprise through its logo and through the food cart design. Inside the festival grounds, the organizers set up white billowing fabric walls on the grounds of Shivaji Park, steps away from the statue of the party founder's late wife that overlooks the park's entrance. Metal detectors funneled the crowd into semi-organized lines, and once through, women in orange saris handed over score sheets printed in Marathi. Booths lined the perimeter of the grounds, each representing a different Vadapau vendor from the city. Each booth was uniquely decorated. One especially creative vendor spelled out Shiv Vadapau and Devanagari script using green chilies, CJ Maharashtra, which is a praise. Maharashtra is a key slogan of the Shiv Sena, spelled out in garlic cloves. Each time I sampled one, a vendor or an assistant gently reminded me to give them a good score. The guests of honor took the stage following several performances, senior executives from McDonald's, Coca-Cola, and the party leader, Udav Thakri. The MC of the program asked the McDonald's and Coke execs to stand and unveiled the official Shiv Vadapau cart to another round of corn toots. On the left side of the stage, drapes fell away on a round dais and beneath it spun the prototype cart, gleaning with stainless steel. The backdrop of the stage glowed with, from the spotlights, enormous photographs of Udav smiling and his father, party leader, party founder, Baltakri, pictured with his fist clenched. McDonald's and Coke logos interspersed these larger than life photos of the party leaders. Udav presented each of the execs with a miniature version of the street cart, prompting more applause. The cart, as I see it here, was a critical sign as the hygienic interface between the winning recipe, the entrepreneurial vendor, and the authentic cosmopolitan consumer. At the conclusion of the event, fireworks exploded and giant sparklers spelling out Vadapau and Marathi burst into flames above the stage. In tracing the Shiv Vadapau through the festival and then in interviews with its vendors, I was struck at how the food was so integral to survival, yet that survival was marked by communal violence throughout the city. Mahesh, one vendor I shadowed at the Vadapau cart he ran with his father, resisted my attempts to think of the food as a channel for cosmopolitan commensality, represented by the range of backgrounds of customers on a busy Mumbai Central Street corner. Mahesh pointed out the corner's geography of street food. 
There's a guy selling sevpuri there across the street, he said. During down the block, there are the sandwich guys. They're bayas, or North Indians. And to some extent, it's affected my business, but I let it go. I helped him set up his father's cart, the original one from 1968, emblazoned with a Shiv Sena logo of a snarling tiger. The tiger still roars, Mahesh said cheekily, anchoring the food as a transmitter of occupations delineated through kinship. Later that day, after a long day of selling, Unprompted, he began talking about the 1992 Bombay riots that pitted Hindus and Muslims against each other. I saw horrible things, he said. A man lit on fire in front of the train station at 10 a.m. in broad daylight. Street kids that took knives and were stabbing people. Horrible, horrible things. It was a dark spot on the city. But dad was out there with a the cart after the curfew ended. No one had food, and, food, and so people lined up for Vodapo. This work defined the kind of political gray zone in which he placed his family, who were Shiv Sena supporters themselves, in light of the Sena's influence of much of that violence. To Mahesh, his father had fed the city during one of its darkest hours. Mumbai's cosmopolitanism might seem self-evident on any given day at his stall, but the brutal violence of communal riots could not be erased from that street corner. The visions of the Sena built around the Shiv Vadapau would morph violence into consumer appeal, cemented through hygiene. In interviews with other Shiv Vodapo vendors, I had asked if they thought their product would incur competition from the number of small corporations that had branded their own versions of Vodapo. These vendors vehemently disagreed. They have an expiry date, one said with distaste. I want fresh food, not food with preservatives. Despite these protests, however, corporate brands of Vodapo have become a regular site at train stations, in malls, and on the streets in the past several years. And this is just a picture of one, um, a very common one called Jumbo King Vodapo, sort of one of the most common um, fast food versions of the food. I met with the CEO of one, one of these companies that I call Maza inside a sprawling suburban, suburban industrial complex months later. In 2004, the CEO, Mr. Anand, and his business partner wondered about doing something with street food after feeling disgusted by the lack of cleanliness they saw on a daily basis. To answer their central business plan question, can we make it like McDonald's, they turned to standardization. Standardization, Mr. Anand claimed, was Maza's unique contribution to a broader project of cleaning Mumbai streets. There are no food laws in India, he complained. Filthy is the vision of foreigners who come here. Even Babur marveled at the lack of hygiene when he, when he arrived centuries ago. Through appeals to contagion, both past and present, Maza's franchises galvanized an ethic of standardization to forestall public disorder. And they added another connective layer, linking bodies and risk. But to standardize a street food, Mr. Anand said, one can't simply operate on a vision of pure sterility, because the dangerous microbes that cause foodborne illness are also the crux of tasty street food. In the home, he said, microbes multiply in food, but not enough to make you sick. But the street poses a more serious problem because, according to him, bacteria multiply more there. Indians are well aware of this, he claimed, and they can taste it. With street food, he said, even if it's vegetarian, those bacteria give the food a taste of non-veg, a taste no chef can give. Uh, and the longer version of this article is called The Taste, the taste That No Chef Can Give. Um, so the challenge, he said, is to corral the disorder of the infectious streets without sacrificing taste. And he felt Maza was unique among all other Vodapau enterprises in accomplishing this feat. That non-veg taste in the food, he said, that's the taste of risk. We market that. We give the street taste without the danger. So in this rendering, contagion was as profitable as it was problematic. It seems to me that the centrality of taste to all of these narratives points to a broader political formation of play. And one might argue that it's a political formation that's only understood except in terms of consumerism. But I think there, there are other things going on here as well. Um, each of the renderings of the Vodapau I've described here briefly has had different ends in sight for the food and the kind of profit that it could bring. But the means converge on hygiene. And more specifically, hygiene as a relation between more and less familiar persons and objects. Contagion created consumptive possibilities. What united the harms and protections enacted by the Vodapo was a matter of what I call tasty contagion, and what Bruno Latour calls an extension of the collective to describe the expansion of possible actors that can make up the social world. So I've argued that tensions between taste, hygiene, and street politics can reveal for us the multiple forms of harm and protection in play about questions of survival in the city. 
and I believe there are several implications to this argument. So first, contagion and contact are important arbiters of body politics that might remain underexplored in accounts only pre premised on public health, where biomedically defined virtues of health are the ultimate measure of life. Second, food politics may be about contest contests over identity, and often are, but the eater is not the only cultural figure whose recognition is at stake here. Ordinary objects and actions, from street carts to automated potato cutters, mediate expressions of authenticity, pleasure, and dismay. These expressions can be understood, I argue, to be about urban order, even as they express instrumental consumption. Finally, the balance between hygiene and harm can be an affective resource that produces a sense of living in the city, or cityness. Making, selling, and eating street food adds up to what Judith Farquhar has described as peopling the city in her work on Beijing, an embodied form of space claiming that she says represents certain rights, memories, and values. So from this perspective, claims to the ideal city emerge in the wake of endless permutations of renewal that destabilize any constants in the equation of urban life. Perhaps beyond misanthropy or xenophobia, we might view contagion as a conduit as of friendship as well in the ways that the Vodapau cement stories with refrains such as Mahesh saying, he is my brother, I let it go, they're bayas, but I let it go, or in the very ordinary pleasures of delicious fried food. Writing on the undercurrents of malice in cities, geographer Nigel Thrift argues that only by facing misanthropy can we reckon with kindness. Thrift suggests that the potential for civic compassion lies in the city's generative adaptability because, as he puts it, the city works as a knot of maintenance and repair activities which cannot easily be unraveled and which allow it to pick itself up and start again. Nigel Thrift is cautious in his diagnostics of urban moods, and I will be as well in conclusion, lest I portray for you street food as the saving grace for complex forms of hatred and violence that dissolve into antiseptic, antiseptic packaging and corporate sponsorship. Yet in food, there is still effective potential a visible political theater, to use Paramaroy's phrase. In Mumbai, heralding that street theater is the Vodapo, soft, crunchy, and contagious as ever. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Very interesting presentation. And again, we'll take questions at the end of the, uh, the three presentations. Uh, next, we have Dr. Chandani, who is a medical sociologist uh, from the University of Colombo, and she's actually here at Syracuse University in the South Asia Center as a Fulbright Fellow, um, and she will be presenting her paper, Health Implications of Agricultural Modernization and Changing Food Consumption Patterns in Sri Lanka. Dr. Chandani. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, within the limited time, I'll try my best to cover vast area. Uh, it's uh, health implications of agricultural modernization and uh, changing food consumption patterns uh, in Sri Lanka. So I'll discuss briefly about the background uh, objectives, setting, and the methodology. And then I will uh, discuss a little bit about uh, traditional practices related to uh, agriculture and uh, food consumption. Uh, then I'll talk about health implications of uh, modernization process with some conclusions. Uh, Sri Lanka has gained many favorable indicators uh, uh, in the area of health compared with uh, other South Asian countries, particularly in the area of uh, reproductive health and successfully uh, controlled uh, number of uh, communicable diseases uh, and uh, favorable health indicators comparatively. Uh, many researchers emphasize uh, these gains as an outcome of uh, interventions implemented by the welfare state since uh, its independence in uh, 1948, uh, particularly in the area of uh, health, education, and agriculture. Uh, however, the current health sector in Sri Lanka is 
facing many challenges in the context of uh, rapid epidemiological transition. Uh, the disease pattern has started shifting trend from communicable to non-communicable diseases. The disease pattern is uh, very much similar like uh, uh, the disease pattern reported in the developed countries. Uh, so uh, the problematic nature of the uh, transition is uh, the cause of disease is not basically medical uh, behavior related. Uh, that required explanations that goes beyond the medical, uh, the dominant medical perspective. So the main, main focus here is on understanding interrelationship between parallel processes of social and epidemiological transitions in contemporary Sri Lanka. Uh, the specific objective of this paper is to explore uh, the health implications of changing behavior related to uh, food production, cuisine, and food consumption with particular emphasis on rural Sri Lanka. Uh, here I argue that the local knowledge base, agriculture, and food practices ensure healthy life of people in traditional society. Further, I argue that the contemporary epidemiological transition needs to be addressed as rather a behavioral issue than a health problem. The paper bases on part of an ethnographic uh, study on chronic kidney disease with unknown etiology, hereafter CKDU, uh, in North Central Province in Sri Lanka. So this is the dry zone part of the country. Uh, CKDO emerged as a problem since late 1980s, and by now it has become a disaster. Uh, main cause of death in the region is now due to CKDO. The sociological study attempted to understand lay perspective and risk behavioral patterns that contributes in this regard. Uh, so we have selected two DS divisions in Anuradhapura district. The north, uh, the north central province has two districts, Anuradhapura and Polonnaruva. So we have selected Anuradhapura district. Uh, in that district uh, also two DS divisions, namely uh, Madhavachya and Padavia DS divisions, uh, mainly due to high prevalence of the uh, disease. So let me very briefly tell you something about the methodology. Uh, we interviewed 200 patients uh, and or uh, their family members, 100 from each division. Conducted series of focus group discussions with various groups and uh, conducted number of in-depth interviews with both male and female elderly villagers uh, to share their uh, live experience on behavioral changes. Uh, throughout the uh, empirical investigation, we conducted uh, observations and secondary materials also reviewed. So now I will discuss very briefly some of the agricultural practices in traditional Sri Lanka. So agriculture was the oldest and main livelihood activity in uh, traditional society. Uh, the social organization uh, was predominantly caste-based, and there was a particular caste for cultivation called govigama, literally mean that uh, cultivator caste. Uh, there were three farming systems, paddy cultivation, tena cultivation, and home gardening. The dry zone gets uh, minimal rain, and uh, paddy cultivation was therefore uh, totally based on small tanks and canal system. Uh, in traditional society, there were many varieties of uh, rice that was based on local knowledge, which stood with uh, ecological conditions, short-term and long-term long varieties, uh, and even preferable characteristics such as uh, color, smell, taste, nutritive value of uh, Price and etc. 
So chain of cultivation also uh, played a major role in the food security in traditional society, uh, which also well organized activity, even though it is a shifting cult cultivation system. Uh, the important point here is the chain of cultivation based on mixed cropping practices. Uh, many varieties of food items, uh, grain pulses, vegetables, and many varieties of cucumber, oil crops, finger millet, etc., uh, which enhance the food security of the society. As proved by agricultural scientists, the mixed crop cropping increases the productivity compared to monocropping due to intercrop competition and the rational utilization of soil minerals uh, reduce the pest attack disease in a crop since other crops act as a biological sense. So there were many magical ritual and uh, healing practices related to uh, chain of cultivation uh, like the paddy cultivation. Home gardens and forest also very, uh, very important in this context. Every household had a home garden that provided uh, supplements for cooking like uh, curry leaves, ginger, uh, etc. and various types of vegetable, uh, fruits and particularly valuable medi medicinal plants. Uh, that enhance the easy access for uh, fresh materials. Uh, the local medical system required very fresh kind of herbal, uh, herbal plants, so they cultivated in their home gardens. Uh, forest too provided many uh, wild lambs, a large number of uh, green leaf vegetables, uh, and etc. So most of the edible stocks were considered as medicine which cure minor ailments and also enhance physical well-being. The agriculture-based lifestyle promoted both physical and mental well-being as it inherited with socio-cultural safety net to protect the villagers from any crisis. Cuisine was considered as one of the 64 noble arts in uh, ancient Sri Lanka, where health was at the center. Uh, they used very simple technology and uh, strategies to protect the nutritive value of food. Uh, for example, the uh, rice, the raw paddy was boiled and dried before removing its hard skin to protect the uh, fiber content. Uh, and uh, further, they used very simple kind of uh, technology to remove the hard skin of the uh, rice. Uh, rice was served with other foodstuffs, uh, cooked in many ways. Uh, mainly there were seven different ways called hat uh, so which included uh, different uh, dishes like uh, one called ambula, it is uh, sautés, the other uh, one uh, gravy, uh, the curry with uh, coconut milk, and then niambalava, so that is uh, without gravy. Uh, and uh, meat they call, uh, sorry, maluma, so it is green leaves, half boiled green leaf uh, with, with uh, grated coconut. And uh, godamas, it's called meat, uh, diamas, uh, seafood, and baduma, this is deep fried something, dry fish or uh, some other vegetables. So uh, the evidence suggests that uh, the villagers uh, had a uh, very good awareness of what the concept of balanced diet, even though uh, they are not uh, expert on how to explain it from scientific manner, but uh, the evidence suggests that the awareness uh, was there already. The menu uh, based on uh, specific occasions, like uh, funeral, weddings, and uh, each activity of the agricultural process, uh, uh, they, uh, they had a particular kind of uh, menu for that particular event. Uh, and the evidence also suggests that uh, health concern is very much there while cooking. 
So I can share with you some of the examples, like uh, whenever uh, the, uh, while uh, combination uh, of the food never mix ginger and manioc because uh, they believe that the mixture can uh, can be poisoned. And uh, another example, uh, they consider bitter gourd as a uh, very uh, healthy vegetable, but they hardly cook it for dinner. Uh, so there is a reason for that also because uh, they knew that the bitter gourd has strong impact on blood. Uh, so this particular area is more vulnerable for uh, snake bites uh, at night particularly. So uh, they believe that if somebody has uh, eaten bitter gourd uh, and uh, snake bite attack, so it's difficult to, uh, difficult to cure. Uh, so they, uh, they try to avoid uh, the risk. And another uh, cucumber called kakiri, uh, this is very common in the locality. So they cook this with seeds, uh, seeds and the skin of uh, this and everything. Uh, because they believe that this particular cucumber can prevent chronic, uh, not chronic, uh, kidney stones, uh, prevent and uh, it's a good medicine uh, for that particular problem. Uh, so uh, the evidence actually suggests uh, the traditional uh, people, they had a very rational kind of behavior uh, in cooking and food consumption. Uh, the main focus is on the balance, how to maintain the balance or the equilibrium. The, no the notion of healthy body is reinforced reinforced uh, by two philosophical traditions uh, that are the Ayurveda and the Buddhism. Uh, almost all food items, they divide it into uh, the two broad categories, like hot and cold. This also uh, influenced by uh, the main concept of Ayurveda, like uh, five elements of the universe and uh, three humors. So they uh, believe that the body is constituted with uh, three humors and uh, health is uh, considered as an outcome of uh, harmonic balance between these three humors. The task of cuisine uh, and food consumption patterns is to maintain the balance between body and uh, physical body and the environment. So villagers are expert on this. Uh, they know how to maintain the balance, particularly uh, what they should uh, cook for dinner and what they should uh, cook for lunch and uh, what are the food items suitable for rain season and dry season, etc. I'm sorry. Sorry about this. Uh, so uh, the middle path uh, of Buddhism that ensured mental well-being. And uh, as Obeseekara argued, uh, the equilibrium is the one of the great philosophical tradition that South Asia can share with the Western world. OK, so let me discuss about uh, what has happened after uh, agricultural modernization. Uh, so the agricultural modernization process, along with other dimensions of social transformation, have brought many adverse effects on healthy life of people. Uh, the process uh, began in Sri Lanka in 1950s, and uh, that has been accelerated since 1977 after introduction of the liberal economic policies. Uh, so as a result, one can see heavy usage of chemical fertilizers and pesticides, not only for pest and disease control, but also for weeding. Uh, farmers are further encouraged to use them by competitive market strategies, uh, even though the agriculture is still uh, at informal uh, level and no uh, labor laws uh, regulations uh, in this regard. 
Uh, the cost is very high uh, for usage of uh, chemical fertilizers, uh, but the government has introduced a subsidy scheme for this. Uh, yeah, so I will uh, focus on dry zone. Uh, the foremost attention given to dry zone throughout the agricultural modernization process as it supplied uh, uh, staple food for the whole country, which resulted heavy usage of fertilizers. Therefore, a unique help has had in dry zone while continuing the common chronic diseases and many so, uh, social environmental uh, issues arise due to this reason. The, re the region has become more vulnerable in prevailing uh, chronic kidney disease that is widely spreading as a disaster, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, this emerged since late 1980s. However, the etiology is uh, unknown yet. The disease commonly manifests in young male farmers, so the labor force affected. Uh, mental well-being of the whole community deteriorated. Most of the uh, food and water sources already affected. Uh, so further, uh, the one can see a uh, number of uh, risk food consumption patterns as well. Uh, so many food varieties now come from outside and less intake of locally origin uh, vegetables particularly uh, that is suitable for the climatic conditions in dry zone. Uh, hardly found many varieties of leaves grown in paddy fields and home gardens in past due to uh, utilization of fertilizer in weeding. Uh, chain of cultivation is not continuing due to many reasons. And uh, junk food is easily available in the locality, plus uh, soft drinks and uh, fruit, uh, instead of uh, fruit juice, herbal uh, juice, and so on. Uh, and uh, in the contemporary society, one can see that uh, easy way of cooking but it also not healthy. As I mentioned earlier, the way they cook a particular vegetable called kakiri. Uh, so they grinded the seed and uh, added it when the curry uh, get half boiled and which required a kind of time and, uh, and effort also. Uh, so NCD is common, uh, that is very visible, which uh, is strongly correlate with everyday, everyday life of the villagers. So many physical activities of both men and women are replaced by machinery. Uh, however, no habit of uh, doing exercises yet. So based on this uh, empirical evidence, I'd like to come to a few conclusions in this paper. The empirical evidence clearly suggests that the contemporary epidemiological transition is one of the negative consequences of agricultural modernization and marginalization of local knowledge systems and cultural practices. Sustainability is at the center within the discourse of agricultural modernization. Uh, it is sustainable in terms of economic and technical terms to a certain extent, as it contributed improving the capacity to cater to the increasing demand of food. However, it has created many health, social, and ecological problems. Uh, again, uh, it's really challenge to move for alternatives such as uh, organic farming under this situation. Uh, and uh, if you consider the health policy uh, in the country, so there are a number of uh, limitations in this regard. Uh, 
the policy is very biased on reproductive health rather than neglecting all the other dimensions. The biomedical system uh, in Sri Lanka, it, operate, it operated uh, from top to bottom, rather against local knowledge, uh, then integrating them into healthcare delivery system. Uh, food is very important in this regard. Uh, evidence of this study suggests that the epidemiological transition is an outcome of social transition, needs to be addressed as a behavioral issue which required a conceptual shift uh, with holistic perspective. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And next we have Amy Nichols, who comes to us from uh, Cornell University, where she's a uh, master's student in two programs, one applied economics management, and one international agriculture and rural development. Amy will be presenting a paper entitled uh, um, Eco-Nutrition Strategy to Improve Food Security in Rural India. Amy? Good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been really looking forward to this opportunity to um, speak with you. Um, basically, I would like to talk with you regarding an eco-nutrition strategy um, that basically looks at the linkages between um, economics, agriculture, nutrition, as well as the environment. I've been interested since coming to Cornell on these linkages and how we can translate them into affirmative action to improve rural livelihood. And this project has been one of two years' worth of work to hopefully take this incredible wealth of knowledge that we have in this room specifically and be able to translate that to improve a specific village that's in this picture called Vrindavan, Uttar Pradesh, India. Um, due to... Um, due to the time constraints we have today, um, my presentation will only cover a bare, bare, bare minimum of what um, the project is really about. But I have two members of my incredible team with me today, and during the question and answer period, they will also be available to answer any in-depth questions you may have regarding this project as well. Um, so we will cover the project area overview, go through a little bit of the framework and strategy behind the model, um, discuss the project pilot, um, and then go into the actual outcomes of what we found and what could be useful to you as you work on projects as well. First off, I would like to begin with discussing Vrindavan, Uttar Pradesh, India, which is located about three hours south of New Delhi. Um, it's noted as a religious village, um, mainly because this is where um, Krishna, the Hindu god, is known to have been raised. Um, because of this, there is a, a large transient community who takes a pilgrimage every single year to Vrindavan, and many of them stay and set up these types of um, these types of makeshift homes. And over time, due to low employment opportunities, um, malnutrition rates have risen and uh, poverty rates are very, very high. Um, because of this, um, many families, such as this family, live in these makeshift homes long term. And malnutrition um, in general is, is a major concern within India. Um, Manamohan Singh um, noted it as a national shame. Um, here, Dr. Patrice Engel discussed it as India accounts for less than 20% of the world's child population, but 40% of the world's malnourished children. Um, Rupa Raghunath Das, he noticed this malnutrition in 2001, and he wanted to create an organization that would be a force for change within Vrindavan, hoping to improve these malnutrition rates. Um, because of this, this um, there was a, a a nonprofit organization called Food for Life Vrindavan, which he created. And it basically took children from a socioeconomic status, which covers these types of facts. These were drawn from um, the registration that they had to complete in order to qualify for this program. Um, basically, I want you to emphasize looking at 60% of the parents who can, um, of the parents of the children who attend this um, school feeding program cannot afford vegetables and clothes. 
Now this school feeding program is specific. It, it emphasizes three square meals a day, two to three square meals a day, um, a K through 12 education, and is meant to be a shelter for these children who basically live on the street. Now, during my, um, during my first phase of my project, which it did, it has turned into three phases, um, I had come to India in January 2011 with this incredible idea that I wanted to analyze soil, because I was interested in the soil science of it all and understand how soil could be translated into increased um, agricultural production, which would then improve um, vegetable variety for these children within this NGO. But I found something very interesting, and this model is drawn from Andrew Jones, who's a postdoctoral fellow at Cornell University, and he's also interested in the different linkages between agricultural production to nutrition. And I found um, that individual dietary intake was a key challenge within Food for Life from Davin. And I decided, you know what, I need to add a couple things to my original model. Therefore, um, while I was sitting and discussing and talking with the children, I located um, and noticed a number of children were picking out their vegetables. As you can see, these darling girls, um, they ate a full lunch, except if you look at their meals, and I'll do a zoom, notice how they've picked out their potatoes, they've picked out their carrots, and they've picked out their broccoli. And originally I thought, okay, it's normal. A lot of children pick out vegetables throughout the world um, and whatnot. Could it potentially be child pickiness? Um, after a little bit more research, I talked with the head um, of Food for Life Rindavan, his name is Rupa, and he said, no, 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 it's not child pickiness. He's like, these children are starving. They have no other meals at home. Generally, their main meal that they would ever have before coming to Food for Life it consisted of salsa and a pickle and some bread. Therefore, and remember back to those statistics, that the parents do not have um, the money to be able to afford vegetables. Therefore, these vegetables are unfamiliar, and the children don't want to eat what's unfamiliar. And this condition is called neophobia. And it's, according to Merriam-Webster's dictionary um, definition, it's a dread or aversion to novelty, something new or unusual, which makes perfect sense. Therefore, the objectives of my original project to analyze soil science changed significantly. Basically, I was looking at three key questions, wanting to know specifically what types of, why the students were picking out their vegetables, which um, was analyzed. And today I'll be discussing, based on that research, what types of models could I combine and what types of multidisciplinary ideas could be pulled together in order to understand and help improve these behaviors and ensure overall nutrition. And finally, ensure that these models were sustainable. We can create incredible models, we can implement them, but it has absolutely no effect whatsoever if we leave the country and it falls through the cracks, which has happened multiple times, especially with this NGO. I did not want to be the next person on the list of another failed project. Therefore, this project was centered around a significant amount of research. Throughout this research, I came upon this um, definition, which is called eco-nutrition. And basically, it pulls ecology and nutrition together to understand the linkages and the constraints within, um, between nutrition and agriculture. Now, this is one example from Dr. Deckelbaum, who worked on the Millennium Villages project. And many of you are probably aware of this project. It's kind of the highlighted project throughout USAID, World Food Program. It's meant to be a shining project that shows the best ways to go about improving livelihoods throughout the world in rural areas. And Dr. Deckelbaum explained eco-nutrition as an integrative environmental health and human health with a particular focus on interactions among the fields of agriculture, ecology, and human nutrition. This is an excellent model. However, it didn't, upon the further research, I realized that this was one example, but it didn't cover the entirety of what I felt eco-nutrition truly was. Therefore, I created my own model based on um, food security, eco-nutrition pulls in ecology and nutrition. It looks at the linkages between environmental health, agriculture, and then that produces into food production and eventually comes out with the outcome of sustainable health. But within this model, it is vital to understand that the social behavior is the barrier to any of these opportunities below. We cannot improve nutrition, we cannot improve ecology if the social behavior is, bar is a barrier. Therefore, um, looking upon the, that specific model and framework, or that specific framework, I also drew upon some successful projects and resources and looked at these five um, specific areas. I looked at different Cornell professors' work, 
which is a Millennium Development Project. Um, Harvest Plus, the IYCN tool, which is known as the Infant and Young Child Nutrition Project, to understand what were the key characteristics that aided their programs and helped them be the most successful. Now, these were the seven characteristics. Mainly, they were conducted in, in multiple phases, which was already what I had planned in general. So that was excellent. It makes sense that you, t you present in one phase, you learn from that phase, you present again, and then hopefully over time it will be perfect, essentially. Second, it needs to be multidisciplinary. Parapens Jeff Anderson, he is one of my advisors. Um, he, had, he has, comes out with a very strong, um, very strong opinion regarding the vital importance of multidisciplinary work. In the past, it is very simple for one discipline, maybe just basic econometrics. Um, econometricians will call it into these varying areas, and based on the economics perspective, take ideas from maybe another perspective and say, well, this is um, how it must be. It is absolutely vital that we come together and collaborate among disciplines. In addition, the opportunity for community empowerment and leadership, use of proven science-based interventions combined with local knowledge and conditions and priorities are vital. In addition, building on a solid infrastructure, strategy, and cost-effective opportunities all will contribute to an overall successful model. Therefore, the emphasis of this, my specific model, was to look at how can we improve children removing their vegetables, and hopefully, over time, help them to make better choices. So this model began um, with coming up with a nutrition deficiency analysis. It draws in 4-H, a notable international program, and under housed under 4-H, it draws in nutrition education, square foot gardening, specifically square foot gardening because it can be used in both rural and urban areas, and they can bring it home and create it in small areas. So it's mobile and useful for these children and easy to understand for a school program. In addition to soil health analysis, I still feel that even though um, the actual agricultural aspect is barred because of behavior, as we're improving behavior, it is also very important to also improve the opportunities for the crops essentially to be available once those behaviors are changed. Okay, but overall, this is a very solid model, and it has been implemented, or it has, it has been, um, it went through phase one, and we piloted it. It has been accepted within the NGO Food for Life, and they are implementing it into their long-term curriculum um, to use it forever, which is exciting. Um, but even though this is a solid model, it is not, it will not be successful unless it's sustainable. And so there is also a sustainability strategy, which I don't have time to discuss, but I'm more than happy to explain it later um, to you. But there's a sustainability strategy behind this. The model began with looking at a specific team, um, drawing upon a specific group of people, and this is a picture of our, my entire incredible team um, that came with me to India. Two of these students are from Cornell, who are here today, um, and each one of these students um, I gave them objectives and basic implementation ideas, and they took those objectives and ideas and then created their own strategy on how to best implement these five different areas within the model. Um, in addition, we, we needed to locate funding for these students. Some of the students found their own funding, but I was able to set up a liaison with um, Brigham Young University Hawaii, and the students, probably about five of those students were able to come on this trip with funding as a type of internship and to act as project managers and as volunteers and learn about eco-nutrition and learn about these different linkages as well as implementing in a real setting. In addition, um, nutrient deficiency analysis was a key aspect of the project. We needed to understand, based on those students who first came to Food for Life in Davin, what was their nutrient deficiency? Where, where did they start from? And what types of additives were given to them through the meals that aided them in overcoming malnutrition? Could there be worms? As an issue, could these students, um, do the students have any previous conditions that influence their health? So basically, on the left-hand side, you see this girl who's showing obvious signs of malnutrition, and on the right side is Sally, who is taking a nutrient analysis, looking at iron deficiency um, through a finger poke. She also took height and weight, um, and also took pictures to understand, uh, to see hopeful, well, not hopeful, but to see p potential signs of malnutrition. In addition to this um, nutrition analysis, we also had the 4-H program um, to be able to determine the actual success of this program. We did a pre-post survey. Um, this 
the nutrition program, as well as Square Foot Gardening, was emphasized to help the children gain familiarity of vegetables from farm to fork, basically. And so overall, we were trying to create this opportunity for students to not only have student empowerment and realize that they have the responsibility and the ability to make their own decisions regarding what they eat, in addition to provide a skill set for them to understand how to, um, how to improve their own nutrition. This is one picture of Morgan. She is also here with us, who um, is surrounded by all these fun children who are so excited about this 4-H program. And Morgan has set up an opportunity for these students to have a liaison between New York 4-H programs as well as India as a support type system for them. In addition, Square Foot Gardening, the children helped create the Square Foot Garden as well as plant those Square Foot Gardens. And within these pictures, it shows Morgan, one of the activities in the nutrition education program was to draw the vegetables. You see these girls with, um, with some tomatoes and, and some lettuce. And this was specifically helping them with vegetable familiarity. In addition to this, we completed the eco-nutrition model with a sustainable soil management. We, looked at, we conducted a soil survey, looked at improved man management practices to overall improve um, the vegetable production, and then finally conducted um, both a composting training as well as a soil survey training with the farmers. So in a sense, we took a total soil survey and found that the soils were saline, and that was due to poor drainage and poor management practices, and found white ants as well as high pH. And on the right-hand side, you can see that based on the pH scale, the food for life and dog and soils were at an 8.3 to up to an 8.5. And if you can see, there, that turns into an alkaline soil and nearly sodic soils. When soil goes to a nearly sodic um, state, it is near unproductive levels. That's why it's so important that we are also looking at soil science as well as the behavior, because what is the point of coming in and doing this, this model and this project if the children change their behavior and the vegetable variety has decreased? In addition to this, um, we also helped them create an organic compost system using the resources that were already available on their farm, which is also the farm supplements the meals within the Food for Life program, and helping them create this system. Basically, they already had a vermicompost system, and the head of Food for Life felt that it was a financial drain because worms are very difficult to keep alive in these soils because they're so hot. Therefore, they had to keep buying worms. So we were trying to help them use an organic system to help improve their soil, um, their soil structure. And finally, we're for overall sustainability, we're looking at both the individual dietary intake, how we can improve the household productive assets and create overall sustainable nutrition. Um, here's a strategy, we don't have time to look at it, but um, I can discuss it later. But the pilot outcomes of the entire model. Basically, we found that sustainable food security is possible by using a multidisciplinary model if it's situation specific if it draws on the needs of the specific NGO, if it's implemented with sustainability in mind, as well as provides useful services. Um, we also found that effective collaboration within multidisciplinary models is extremely challenging. We each have our different ideas of, and what we've studied and learned through extensive research of how best to implement ideas. And so having a conflict in ideas among different disciplines is very difficult for moving things forward. So it's very important to find the right team and the right different individuals who can collaborate and understand that sometimes you have to work among different disciplines. In addition, infrastructure was key to successful implementation, um, as well as Food for Life could be a potential model for a larger scale project to provide sustainable food, insecure, or food security. And finally, student comments displayed overall learning. We found two different students and two different ideas. Um, every day during the school meals, everyone sits down on these long mats and we were sitting down and one of the girls took a ladle of food to serve us and she goes, protein, <laughs> and put it down on our plates. And then another young boy came up to um, one of our teachers over the square foot garden and he said, you know, I have been trying to garden at home for so long and now I know how. And we can, we can implement these models and provide opportunities for years, but to hear how it directly impacts these children, it made this all worth it. All the incredible amount of work. So finally, I'd like to end with this picture that shows a perfect example of what we're trying to do with, the, with this model. On the left-hand side is a young girl with obvious signs of malnutrition, and on the right-hand side is a girl who's shown vast improvement 
um, from original states within Foods, um, upon starting at Foods for Life from Daven. And basically this shows the opportunities that we have to improve malnutrition through this type of model and to allow them the opportunity to live a productive and full life with full health. Thank you for your time. I know we're uh, a little bit behind schedule, but we have an hour and a half scheduled for lunch, so we can eat a little bit into our lunch time. Um, do we have our speakers over? Uh, questions, comments from participants? Yes. Sure, maybe we can address the first one first and then go on to your second question. Um, that's a great question. I have to think more about that. Um, so risk from the viewpoint of the marketers of the um, kind of commodified Vodapo, um, I think they were very interested in marketing, you know, as I said, about this sort of risk of um, poor hygiene. But from the consumer's perspective of um, kind of friends, I guess, and on one hand, uh, I mean, people like the taste of, uh, there's also a familiarity with the street corner that you know, and there's a particular flavor. I mean, people go to particular vendors. So I don't think that the, the, um, the risk was um, hygiene as much as perhaps betrayal of your favorite, <laughs> your favorite vendor, the risk at stake is different. And then there's a different one with, um, with young people. Um, I had a chance to sort of at a different element of the project to do field work with um, young adults in a kind of a training program to work at uh, a pizza restaurant. And I remember they always would talk about how the um, commodified Vodapau, like the jumbo or whatever, they're very expensive. I mean, they're, they're much more expensive. Vodapau is about five rupees, it could be eight, depending. Um, on the, the season and the price of potatoes. Um, but these commodified ones can be much more. The marketed ones can be 15 or 20. So it, there's a lot more expensive. So to them, the risk was actually, um, you know, risking, you know, losing money. Um, but I think in the end, the people who are at the train stations who are buying the, mar the, um, the jumbo and the things that are plastic wrapped aren't concerned as much about hygiene as they are about being late. There's a, so there's a risk of, of missing work. There's a labor there, so I have to I have to unpack risk a little bit more there. So I guess um, risk is a everyone is concerned about risk, but it's not always about um, a health risk. Does that does that? Answer? Yeah, I guess my, I, I guess my sense was that the risk that comes from food. Yes. Well. Yes. Yeah, that, that's definitely the case. And there is something to be said for um, eating. I mean, people are very, are very clear that eating on the street can be dangerous, but who cares because it tastes good. And, you know, you get a little, you get a little sick, that's okay. But um, there, that's right. So risk, is, in, in that sense, from the consumer's perspective, risk can be positively and cool. Yeah, it's adventurous. It's the, um, what is it, the Andrew Zimmer and Wild Foods sort of, you know, kind of invocation there.
interesting. Exactly. That's a really good point. I think um, one thing one thing that's interesting about Vrindavan is it's very difficult to find any former research found in Vrindavan. It is definitely an area that has not been researched. So in a sense, that was part of the appeal to work in Vrindavan, simply because we were treading new ground. Um, there was one previous research basically looking at um, the socioeconomic status of the students and from which um, type of environment they came from, which is also where some of these statistics had been pulled from. And so I knew that the students weren't used to vegetables in general. And um, based on researching neophobia, um, which is also not, um, well, based on researching neophobia as well as discussing the matter with the head of the NGO who'd been looking at this and watching it for the past 10 years, um, it was between those two sources that I realized this is definitely um, one of the areas that could potentially be a problem. Um, you, you're definitely right on that some of these meals are not, um, because they're trying to add in as many vegetables as there are and that's not normal, generally it is mostly curry, um, you're absolutely right on in the sense that this is all new. But one item that we took into account is that the children were starving. Um, that they really did not eat very much food ever at home. Um, that they literally came to Food for Life Vrindavan at, in a very malnourished state. And over time, you can see how they've improved their nutrition um, since being a, in part of the program. So um, does that answer your question in a sense a little bit? We can talk more. <laughs> Jip Morgan, she she headed that part of the program. But. And generally, the vegetables were cooked to the extent that you couldn't really tell that it was lettuce or, or spinach or whatnot because it was so cooked into the meal. And so um, trying to help the children understand that vegetable from the specific farm all the way to the point that they eat it, part of the program was to take them to the kitchens and help them see how it's cut up and cooked and whatnot so they could see exactly what they're eating and make informed choices. Do you actually, is the chronic kidney disease, can you 
say what's really causing it? So those are my questions. Go on, you can explain that. Yes, please. <laughs> Actually, if uh, uh, the lay perception is very important in this regard, so they directly relate uh, the etiology of the dis disease with their behavior. Uh, the the uh, narrative suggests that uh, they, they try to compare their lifestyle with the past, and they recognize the disease also as a recent phenomenon. As I mentioned, the disease uh, is emerging in the in the locality since 1980s, so it has a relationship with agricultural modernization. Even though it introduced in the 1950s, uh, the process accelerated since 1977 after introduction of uh, the liberal economic policies and a lot of chemical fertilizers come into uh, utilization and. Uh, uh, the instructions also uh, come from top to bottom and hardly concern about the uh, cultural background. So uh, people hardly use uh, instructions, even though the bottle of fertilizer or chemical, it says you need to use mask and this is the way you have to spray the fertilizers and all, but they hardly uh, follow the instructions and all. And uh, the other reason they think uh, uh, changing uh, food pattern also, like uh, they eat uh, some vegetables and herbal things which, uh, which prevented this kind of disease. The one good example that uh, I mentioned, the vegetable kakiri uh, kind of uh, cucumber. So they experience that it, it has an impact. Uh, uh, quickly it can uh, solve the uh, stone of the kidney. Uh, so now they hardly take this kind of vegetables and everything come from uh, other places and all. Uh, so they directly relate this into, uh, into their behavioral patterns and all the water sources are affected. That is one reason because, uh, uh, because of uh, the uh, inability of continuing chain of cultivation, they started cultivation, all the vegetables in their home gardens with fertilizers. Mm -hmm. So they are drinking water well also in the same space. So all the water sources also affected. Uh, so that way uh, the lay discourse clearly suggests the cause of the disease is very much related with their behavior. I want to answer about maternity. Um, so I, I think this, mine is also could be read as a narrative about neoliberal uh, conditions as well, this, except in a very different place, not terribly far away, but it's in the city. Um, and here I'm interested in thinking about how um, risk and disease, these tropes of colonial modernity, um, I think Deepesh Chakrabarty writes about garbage in Kolkata and lots of that stuff about, you know, become profit opportunities as well. Um, so they, they're not necessarily modes of, um, of governance. <laughs> Of, of subduing, but they become immense profit opportunities as well. Questions? I actually have one I'd like to, to ask. Uh, uh, from our work in Tibet, we were looking at an, another population that's pretty severely micronutrition, micro malnourished um, in terms of micronutrients. And so we went in with a model similar to what you described wanting to look at increased productivity and spend a lot of time on that. Um, to make a long story short, the, the increase in productivity didn't lead to an increase in consumption or, or the health changes that, that were anticipated to be seen from that. Um, and rather, the increase in productivity uh, in a more diverse type of vegetable that would give the micronutrients that we were looking for. Um, led to, th those were sold. Those were sold to people from the, the China mainland, and Tibetans weren't eating them, so their, their micronutrition wasn't changing in that sense, and people, where they could, they would sell things by get money and then buy Pepsi and instant noodles. So what we didn't see was a health increase, and it sounds like from Chandani, from what you were describing, it, it's not exactly clear that the increase in productivity, agricultural productivity, led to health changes, and I guess, Amy, are you really thinking that with increased productivity, increased agricultural productivity, 
are you expecting to see that change consumption and change health? Okay, um, absolutely not. <laughs> um, and that may sound surprising. Because of um, there is so much research out there showing that increased productivity ne doesn't necessarily translate to increased nutrition. But knowing that these children, yes, they have vitamin supplements that d do help their micronutrient deficiency. The biggest concern that I wasn't able to explain during the presentation was that the children are picking out their vegetables and they're not consuming the vegetables. And so over time, when they leave Food for Life Rindavan and they are in basically this um, this habit of picking out vegetables and not consuming vegetables, their malnutrition will will increase after they leave Food for Life Rindavan simply because they will not have those supplements after they leave. So part of, and a major part of the project was to hopefully influence that behavior. And so once they leave Food for Life Rindavan, they can continue that behavior of eating vegetables, regardless of what vegetables they are, that they can specifically get those micronutrients that are, um, that are regularly occurring in multiple different kinds of vegetables and realize why it's important to make wise decisions on eating vegetables as opposed to other types of foods. Does that make sense? Sure. Jen Dunny, do you have any observations relating to agricultural productivity increasing consumption and health in Sri Lanka? Yeah. Uh, I think uh, the nutrition, uh, malnutrition uh, reduced to a considerable extent. Uh, but uh, the other dimensions really neglected uh, when the policymakers they uh, very much concerned on the increasing food and solving the malnutrition problem. Uh, but uh, what I see is uh, the other socio-cultural dimensions are neglected. So my concern is uh, which required a holistic kind of perspective uh, to deal with uh, the, all the dimensions. Uh, any final questions? Yes. So that model of assuming, sorry, the model of assuming um, increased productivity and nutrition will follow is really one that we're seeing can be quite flawed. Any final questions? Well, thank you to our speakers of this session. We appreciate your time.